Ready? Well, it is good to see every one of you here tonight for our Wednesday evening midweek Bible study, worship time together. I want to ask you, invite you to take your hymn sheet out of your prayer list that you should have there. Randy's passing some out now if you don't have one already. And we're going to begin by singing that hymn together, A Shelter in the Time of Storm. The Lord in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, rock divine, oh, refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. All right, if our ushers would make ready, we'll prepare to take up our midweek tithes and offerings. We'll ask God to bless in our offering this evening. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for the privilege you've given us to meet together as a church family again. We pray your blessings on your word this evening as it's preached and taught. Lord, we pray that you'd be with the offering, with the worship, with the fellowship, with the kids' classes that are going on tonight. We pray, Lord, that you bless it all. And these things we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, go ahead and turn your hymn sheet over there. We're going to continue to worship the Lord together with the hymn, The Solid Rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. to follow along with me this evening inside your prayer list as well. And we're going to be in the book of Genesis. We're actually going to be looking at uh, several different passages of scriptures. You can see at the top of your study sheet there this evening, looking at several different passages of scripture this evening. We're talking about the idea of God designing male and female. So of course, we're talking about gender issues, and we're really going to be in the book of Genesis and some other uh, passages of Scripture for several weeks here on Wednesday night through our D6 Bible study curriculum that we use in here on Wednesday evening. I came across a little article that I wanted to share with you guys tonight before we get into tonight's Bible study. It's from a site called the Babylon Bee. I don't know if you're familiar with the Babylon Bee. They are a a very much a satire website. So they're, they're, they're poking fun at, at issues, a lot of times from a very scriptural uh, uh, position. So I want you to listen as I read this. I think we're all in here will catch on really quickly to the point they're trying to make through satire here, okay? After weeks of study and watching YouTube videos on the subject, a local iPhone 12 has concluded that Steve Jobs never existed. Hang on, we'll get there. Keep, we'll keep, stay with me. He said, that's cool if you want to believe in fairy tales, said the iPhone with the tip of his brand new fedora. But I'm a free-thinking iPhone, 
Am I really supposed to believe an intelligent being designed me? Look at me. My battery life is only 15 hours and I'm useless. My screen can break if you drop me. Android has a million features I don't even have. I am a far from perfect design. What kind of creator would allow that anyway? The iPhone also says the reliability of accounts of Steve Jobs' existence is sketchy at best. I've never seen Steve Jobs, he said. He died long before I was born. Convenient, right? My theory is that his status was elevated to iPhone creator long after his death to help other iPhones explain their sad existence. The Steve Jobs story is most likely plagiarized from the story of Thomas Edison, another alleged creator. The iPhone told reporters he is convinced that he is nothing more than a naturally occurring collection of raw materials from the earth, saying he feels like life is so much more precious and meaningful now that he can create for meaning himself rather than having that meaning given to him by some ancient story for weak minds. When you think about it, all iPhones are deniers, said the iPhone. Other iPhones deny the existence of creators as well. They deny that Al Gore or Mary Poppins invented them. I simply deny one more creator than they do. The iPhone also insists he functions perfectly despite his denial. As a brand new iPhone, I don't need to believe in the existence of Steve Jobs to function per properly. I work fine even though I don't believe. According to sources, the iPhone reports being very happy and fulfilled since falling unto unbelief. He has since joined an unbelievers book club to meet other iPhones like him. And I thought that was a pretty neat little bit of satire there, uh, you know, kind of poking at folks who claim there is no God. But anyway, on we go. So I thought that would kind of fit a little bit with the Genesis record that we're talking about this evening. We're going to deal with a specific aspect of God's creation tonight, and that aspect is the creation of gender creation of gender. I want you to look with me at Genesis 2, so we're going to begin this evening. We're going to read verses 18 through 24, and you'll see on the study sheet we're going to be jumping around back and forth between the Old and the New Testament this evening several different times. So we're going to start in Genesis 2, verses 18 through 24. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help me for him. Now I want us to stop here. This is kind of a side issue here. But it's interesting that the way God brings Adam to the knowledge that he's about to get to. Adam is going to come to understand that Eve is his mate. But God already purposed that. Did you see that? Verse 18, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make a help meet for him. And then from that purpose, he begins to take Adam through a process. And he begins by having Adam name the animals. And as Adam names all the animals, the writer here says there wasn't a help meet found for Adam. Now God knew that was going to happen, right? He said in verse 18, I'm going to create a help meet. All the animals had already been created. But God is taking Adam through a process of understanding and coming to know what God knows. See? So let's keep reading here. Verse uh, 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Notice the way that God brings Adam to an understanding of what he wants him to know. His intent was... Adam is going to understand that Eve was created to complement him and vice versa. And so he takes him through a process. He first has him understand and view all the other animals that were created and understands in naming each of them, there is not a suitable complement for me. There's not a suitable mate. 
help me for me. And then God performs a first surgery, right? He puts Adam under, if you will. He takes part of his body, creates Eve from that portion of his body. And then we see Adam, man, he, he's excited here. This is bone of my bone. This is flesh of my flesh. She is woman. She is my helpmate. And so God is helping Adam understand his purpose in design. And that's exactly what Scripture does for every one of us. Helps us to understand God's purpose in design. And the Bible is very clear in both the Old Testament and the New Testament that when God created, He created a specific number of genders. Our culture today wants to indicate that there are just all sorts of types of genders. But God says in this passage, He created two, male and female. There was a Gallup survey done just a couple of years ago indicating that as of 2021, 7.1% of people across all generations in America identify as LGBTQ. 7.1%. That's actually higher than what I expected when I read it. I was expecting, from what I understand, about 3.5% of everyone in America identifying as LGBTQ. But when you look at the breakdown in age ranges, you understand what's happening. What they call traditionalists, that's the first time I'd heard that term before as far as a, an age range. It's those born before 1946, 0.8% identify as LGBTQ. Of the baby boomers, 46 to 64, 2.6%. Of Generation X, 65 to 80, 4.2 percent. But now look at this. Generation Z, Gen Z, 97 to 03, 97 to 03, 20.8 percent. 20.8 percent. And Millennials, 81 to 96, 10 and a half percent identify as LGBTQ. What we see here is the younger generations, as morality has begun to devolve in our country, there are more and more of the younger generations being influenced by this sort of sin. And that's what it is. That's what the Bible calls it. It is sin. It is Romans 18 playing out in America. And if things continue as they will, then that number is going to continue to grow with the next generation and the next generation. And if the United States of America continues for another hundred years, what will be the amount of people who are, if, if not identifying as LGBTQ, at least okay with and affirming of LGBTQ? And so as that continues to play itself out, what, what's the other side of that coin? Well, if these people are all engaging in these sorts of relationships, then the population is going to recede. There are going to be fewer and fewer and fewer births and fewer and fewer and fewer people. Why? Because they're going against God's design. So tonight we're going to ask this question. You see it there the top, near the top of your study sheet. What does God have to say about gender? What does God have to say about gender? And we're going to be back and forth between the Old and New Testaments to kind of get a, a grasp. And, and these are very general ideas, but there's things that we need to, to remind ourselves of and understand that Scripture speaks very clearly to this idea. Number one, your first fill-in-the-blank statement, God designed, God designed gender creating males and females. God designed gender creating males and and female. Statement letter A underneath answer number one. God designed his image bearers in two separate genders that they might complement each other. Complement each other. It's interesting today you read a passage like what we just read in scripture and you'll have some who will say, well that passage in and of itself represents the idea that Christianity is chauvinistic. It promotes the gender of males above females. But if you read that honestly, you don't see that there. What you see is God's design for complementary living. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. 
It's another part of this creation uh, um, account. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So man cre God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So as the Bible's been referring to man, it's really just referring to the way that we would say mankind, humankind, males and females. We understand that when we get to the end of verse 27, male and female created he them. Verse 28, and God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Just based on these two passages of Scripture alone, we understand there is no ambiguity in the Bible about God's opinion on gender. It's male and female. And God created male and female for some very specific purposes, one of which is to fulfill what's called the creation mandate. We just read that. It's Genesis 1:26 through 28 is what it is, where God says to fill the earth and subdue it. Now those two ideas, those two commands, they, they, they go hand in hand. Because in order for humankind to subdue the earth, there's got to be a whole bunch of them, right? And in order for that to happen, then you have to fill the earth. And the only way that we can fill the earth with human beings is the way God designed it. A male and a female. Through the covenant of marriage. And so the Bible, even from the very beginning, begins to unveil God's plan and His design here in the idea of two genders coming together in the covenant of marriage and thereby reproducing, multiplying, filling, and subduing the earth. So when we decide as humankind to rebel against that design, what's going to happen? Well, the multiplication numbers are going to start to go the wrong direction. And as there become fewer and fewer and fewer people, then there are less of us to subdue and bring into submission to God all of His good creation. There are actually countries, and I didn't have the time to look at the stats, but there are multiple countries in the world right now that are dealing with this very issue. Their death rate is outpacing their birth rate. And these countries are literally, as countries, are dying. Why? Because you have humankind as a society rebelling against God's design. For whatever the reason may be, God's design is male and female, marriage, multiplication, subdue the earth. And here we see also not just that we're supposed to subdue the earth, and it, so it's, 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 it's God's way of, of, of bringing all, uh, His created order into greater glory to Him, but we also understand that humankind as two genders were created by God to complement one another, males and females. I don't know if any of you, the rest of you have noticed this, but I, I, I have. Males and females are very different. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? We are very, very different. And I'll tell you something else I learned, Steve. I learned this after I got married that I didn't realize just how different males and females really are. I came to a whole new understanding of all that after being married. We don't, I'm telling you, it's like, somebody wrote a book years ago, it was popular for a while, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. That man's been married a while. I mean, he has. Because there are times it feels like, man, I am, you're from a different planet than me, honey. What in the world? We communicate differently. We understand things differently. Females are far more perceptive than men. There's stuff I'm, just, I'm not paying attention to, brother. And she is, and she thought I was, and that's a problem sometimes. And you see, I can say all that with, with I, I can just speak very freely tonight because Hope's at home sick. 
So, so yes, yeah, she is. Oh, don't feel too bad for her. She's not, you know, on death's door. No, she's that, that's that's not live streaming right now. You're gonna edit this, Tim. You're gonna edit this out. So, when... <laughs> all right, right. Increase the volume on this part. No, she is she is under the weather, but she's Lord willing, she's improving. Uh, but uh, and I, I talked to, as a matter of fact, me and and Jerry and Bob Beverly were, were at breakfast today at the Apple Barrel, and um, we were talking about marriage. And, and, and I had been talking on that subject to our teens uh, here at the, at the school. I teach a high school Bible class, and, and well, I, I got onto the subject of marriage today and the idea that our culture today wants to indicate that a, a love relationship, a, a romantic marriage relationship, that what you should, should, should uh, the goal is, is what really represents the first little bit of, of marriage, the, the attraction the physical, the, the love, all the excitement of that initial connection. And then, do you ever see movies that talk much about anything other than that? The falling, if you will, though I don't believe in that. I don't believe anybody falls in love. You make a choice. But, but the falling in love part, you, you see a lot of movies on anything other than, no. Because the rest of marriage in, in the movie industry's eyes, is not worth their time and attention. It's not going to sell a lot of tickets to a theater. But that part is the part that God promotes in Scripture because marriage is commitment. That's what love is. Love is a choice. Love is a choice. Love is a choice in spite of other options. Love is, I choose you. I choose you when it's inconvenient for me. I choose you when I may not feel like choosing you. I choose you. And I asked the kids today, I said, you think that Jesus went to the cross because of warm, fuzzy feelings for you? No. Absolutely not. But you have the most beautiful picture of love in the crucifixion of Christ. And it has nothing to do with physical attraction or warm, fuzzy, romantic feelings. It has to do with commitment. I choose. I choose you. Though I could choose others, I choose you. And that's what marriage is about. And we see it in Scripture. That's God's design for humankind. As we love one another, we uh, complement each other. Here's letter B statement under answer number one. Jesus affirmed, affirmed God's design for gender and marriage. Jesus affirmed God's design for gender and marriage. Now we're going to skip down to Matthew 19, the New Testament, if you want to flip there. Matthew 19, verses 3 through 6. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? So they're asking him about divorce, which at this time, and we talked about this before, but in first century Palestine, all the, um, the, the marriage laws favored the male because at, at this time in history, the males were the ones with all of the authority. I mean, not a little bit of the authority. They had all of the authority. So a man at this time, he could divorce his wife for any reason at all. She didn't please him. He didn't like her one day. He woke up in a bad mood. He can divorce her for any reason at all. And so they're challenging Jesus on this. Verse 4, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, and he's getting ready to quote from Genesis 2, what we read just a few minutes ago. He's quoting Genesis. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Jesus affirms the idea of gender as we see in the creation account. And so there are people today that want to try to divorce the Old and New Testaments. A lot of preachers of, of some big churches, men like Andy Stanley, North Point Church in Atlanta, Georgia, he wants to teach that we need to unhitch, that's his term, unhitch the New Testament from the Old Testament. And the reason is because many people don't ever really study their Old Testament, and so they don't appreciate the, what the Old Testament has to tell us. And they look at it as this God of vengeance. 
and rules and regulations and judgment and pestilence and all of this sort of stuff. And it's totally different from the New Testament, which is grace and love and Jesus, right? He's for us all. He loves us all so much. But the, the truth is, we see that in the Old Testament as well. Matter of fact, part of what makes Jesus so incredible in the New Testament is the way that God set him up in the Old Testament through the Old Testament prophets. And so Jesus, yes, he's a God of grace and love and mercy, just as the God of the Old Testament was because he's the same one. But he's also a God of judgment and a God of justice and a God that will name sin. And so he affirms here the Old Testament account of two genders for the purpose of marriage, male and female. Jesus does speak on hot button issues of our day, including gender, and we see it here. What does God have to say about gender? Number one, God designed gender, creating males and females. Number two, God's design for gender was marred by the fall. God's design for gender was marred by the fall. What's the fall? The fall is Genesis 3, where Adam and Eve eat of the forbidden fruit. They rebel from, against God. They commit the first sin, and that represents mankind's fall. I want you to go ahead and write in, if you're following along on the sheet, letter A statement. As a result, the role relationship between man and woman was cursed. Cursed. As a result, the role relationship between man and woman was cursed. Look at me, look with me at Genesis 3. I know we were just in Matthew. Now we're going back to the Genesis account. Genesis 3, God has come down and confronted Adam, Eve, and the serpent regarding the sin, the eating of the forbidden tree, the forbidden fruit. And he curses the serpent, he curses Eve, and he curses Adam. Now, Genesis 3.16 is specifically God's curse on Eve. So it's God's curse to Eve to ladies, to the females. Verse 16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And so we all understand exactly what God is saying there. We understand that when a woman gives birth to a child that she is in, in a sense walking through the valley of the shadow of death herself. There are women who lose their lives as a result of childbirth. It's a, it's a big deal. And I, my hat's off to every lady who has ever given birth. I don't understand how in the world a woman can give birth more than one time. Why in the world would you experience that and then decide at some point, yeah, you know what, I'll do that again. But I'm grateful for all of you that did, you know, with the exception of my mom, because I was a firstborn. She could, should have stopped with me. No, nah, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm joking. Uh, so, so childbirth, pain in childbirth, we get that. But the greatest effect of the curse on a woman comes next. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. What is God saying in this curse? What he's saying is that as a result of this fall, part of the sin nature of a woman is to desire the authoritative God-given position of the man. And as a result, there is struggle. There is tension. Because God did create and ordain. Man, it's just too clear in Scripture to not understand this. God created and ordained males to be in authority. May I say this, and this is not going to be appreciated by some, this is going to sound very chauvinistic. But I hesitate. I balk at the idea of a female president. I can't believe that you'd say that. I didn't say I'd never vote for a female to become president of the United States. Because if, if there's a conservative female, well, running against some of the people that are in office right now, then I might be willing to do just that. But, and I'm not, am I saying it would be sin? No, but, but... Scripture's very clear. Males have been given the commission to be an authority over the home, over the church. We see that being attacked today, even amongst conservative evangelicals, over the church. Women are not. It would be against the teaching of Scripture for a woman to stand in my place right now and do what I'm doing. 
That doesn't mean that there aren't women in this room who might not be able to do a better job than I can. <laughs> but that does not negate what God clearly commands in Scripture. And here's the problem. Here's why that's such a problem today. It's not because God has changed. It's because our culture has. And our culture has so developed this understanding of co-equality that we see God's commands like this one. The man is to have authority over the woman, over the home, and, and, and to, to be the authority in the world. We, we see that as God saying that the man is better than, that the female and the male are not equal. That's not true. It's not true. We are absolutely equal in value. We are both image bearers of God. But we have been given clear responsibilities by our Creator. And as a female, there are things that you have been commissioned by God to do that I as a male am not allowed to do. I can't give birth. And I'm so, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I can't give birth. I can't grow another human inside my body. I can't feed that human that I birthed from my body with my own body. That's beautiful. That's amazing. We celebrate those things. That is part of God's commission for a female, and we should celebrate and honor that. Part of God's commission for a man is to be the authority. Yes, sir, David. Well, see, that's the problem, brother, is that if man, if I won't take that authority and that responsibility, then God will use whatever... Mm -hmm. And we even see that in Scripture. Yes, You've got individuals like Deborah. And that's a problem today that so many males don't want to take the responsibility at home and church mm -hmm. and the government. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. If the man won't step up, then God will be used. Yeah, he'll use who he has to use, absolutely. If you look at the church today, the majority that bring the kids to church is women. Mm -hmm. and yes. So yeah. God will use whoever to get the job done right. Mm -hmm. But you're right, the man's to have the, the right. And, the to and I would say, and you're totally right, I completely agree with everything you'd say you say here. And 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 part of why that's such a problem is because of what we just read. Mm -hmm. Verse 16. It's okay. part of the curse, part of the fall. I've always wondered where was Adam when the devil was talking to Eve in the garden? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean you mm -hmm. have a conversation between the Adam and uh, between Eve and the devil. And I was wondering, well, where was Adam? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great point and a great question. I mean, I've asked this brother pastor saying they don't seem to know him. I don't know either, but where was he mm -hmm. when he was out there messing with the devil? Right, right. It's at least a question worth pondering. Absolutely. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, who knows? Um, but um, I was going to say something funny, but I'm not going to because I don't think it'd be that funny. So I'm going to leave it alone. Um, yeah, no, he's exactly right. Exactly right. And that's part of the curse is this struggle. Yes, sir, Brother Jerry, go ahead. Uh, he was right there next to her because she gave him, after she took the bite, she gave it to him and he ate. Hmm. So it seems mm -hmm. like that he was right there. Yeah, So, which further, I, I really think that enhances your point. Yeah. I think it does. If that's where he was, then why in the world wasn't he the one talking why instead of Eve? Talking? Huh? Exactly. That? Exactly, yes. Why didn't he exercise authority in that, in order to protect, in order to protect his, his, his wife? No, I totally agree. Good points. So what, yeah, I, I heard you, I heard you. So the point we're getting to is the whole eating of the apple or, or the fruit really was Adam's fault. And we want to try to blame it on, a, Miss Davenport came up with that. Thank you, sister. It really was Adam's fault. And you know what? I, I can't argue against that. I mean, we say it kind of jokingly, but you really can't argue against that. That it was. But if, if God has given Adam the role of authority over Eve as part of their complementary way of connecting with each other, then ultimately the responsibility for Eve's protection from something like Satan would have fallen on Adam. So it results in a shirking of his responsibility. No, that's exactly right. You know what? Why don't the three of you, well, not you, you can't get up here, but the two of you, you, you I tell you what, you sit right there and you can talk. Just don't stand up here, okay? Uh, <laughs> I hear you, I hear you. Uh, so as a result, the role, relationship between man and woman was cursed. And, and we, we, man, a, a lot of people today, man, in our culture today, the idea of Christianity and the things that we're talking about tonight, oh, that's so chauvinistic. 
that you would say that a, a woman can't stand in front of a group of a mixed group of adults, men and women, she can't teach a man. That's what the Bible tells me. And again, it goes back to this idea of complementing one another through roles. Part of, the, part of the way God has wired a man is to be in authority. Part of the way that God wired a man is to stand as a protector and as a provider. And part of the way God has wired a woman is to nurture and, 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 and be in that environment as the wife and the mother. And anyway, we don't have time to, to keep on with that, but uh, let's move on. Uh, letter B under answer number two. As men and women come to follow God's principles, they fight against, is your fill-in-the-blank statement there. As men and women come to follow God's principles, they fight against the curse. We're not going to read all of this passage of Scripture for time's sake, but we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Paul is writing here, he says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as this church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, Paul is affirming what we just talked about. God designed, commissioned men to be the authority. And as we function properly under the headship, ultimately, of Jesus Christ, then a woman submits to the authority of her husband. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And we'll stop there for time's sake. But I want you to go back and look at this. Um, Verse 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives. That is God's design. But we're talking about the idea that God's design for gender and marriage was marred by the fall, right? So my sin nature, why this is God's design as a woman to submit and as a husband to love, my sin nature pulls me away from that. My sin nature makes it a struggle. My sin nature makes it feel at times unnatural to me. Does that negate the command and design of God? No. And so as I strive to do what may not always feel the most natural for me as a male trying to be loving, as a female trying to submit, as I do that, I push back against the curse. I push back against the effects of the fall. And I make myself, my marriage, my family more in line with the lordship, headship of Christ and His plan for our lives. All right. For uh, time's sake, let's keep moving here. Um, what does God have to say about gender? Number one, God designed gender, creating males and females. Number two, God's design for gender was marred by the fall. And number three, God can heal and renew those harmed by gender identity issues. God can heal and renew those harmed by gender, gen, excuse me, gender identity issues. I want you to go ahead and uh, fill in, if you're following along on your study sheet, uh, answer or, or uh, statement A under answer three. God forgives and gives new life, life to people who turn away from sin to follow and obey Him. God forgives and gives new life to people who turn away from sin to follow and obey Him. I'm in 1 Corinthians now, verse chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. <laughs> Boy, he gives a list of some nasty stuff there. By the way, he's talking to the church at Corinth, and this church was, you know, when he wrote to they were in a mess. A lot of sexual sin going on uh, there in that church. And so Paul is writing to try and help them, try and help them clean up their act, if you will. And so, he, man, he's laying it on them. Don't you be deceived. 
none of this crowd's going to get into the kingdom of God. And he starts nesting off some nasty, dirty, awful, wicked, sinful stuff. And then he reminds them, lest they get some sort of self-righteous attitude, he says, hey, don't forget, such were some of you. We all have the capacity for great sin, wickedness, rebellion, in each and every one of our human hearts and minds. It's bound up in every one of us. Now let's keep reading. But ye are sanctified. Ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Paul here is helping these Corinthian believers remember that they have sin struggles too. So when it comes to the issue of LGBTQ, and now there's the plus symbol and trans and all sorts of stuff, somebody calls them the alphabet people. I think that's kind of a appropriate. Uh, but all of, that, all of that stuff, when we look at that, it's easy for us as church people sometimes to look down on those folks. I mean, yeah, we're sinners saved by grace, but that crowd, man, they're way off the mark. They're far worse than us. And through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul tries to help us understand, no, that's just not right. Not true. We're, we're, we're the same kind of broken. We may be broken in a little bit different spot, but we are the same kind of broken. And we need to remember that as we interact with people who may be struggling. Hey, I, I can't, I can't, I, I really can't. I, I can't wrap my mind around an individual struggling with same-sex attraction. I don't, but from what I understand of the brokenness of this world, hey, by the way, it fits perfectly with a biblical worldview that there would be people who do. And they aren't any more broken than I am. They aren't any more broken than I am. I got to remember that. I need the same grace they need. I need the same forgiveness. I need the same mercy from Christ that those individuals need. Here's your last fill in the blank statement. We're going to be almost through here. Following Christ is a commitment to die to ourselves. Following Christ is a commitment to die to ourselves. Matthew 16, 24, last passage of Scripture this evening. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Following Jesus comes at a price. It comes at a price. Following Jesus costs every one of us something. We have to be willing to submit every part of ourselves to His Lordship, and that includes our sexuality. I'm going to close with this, uh, this thought. Uh, is this summer sometime, I don't remember exactly when, my family and I, we really enjoy eating a Hideaway Pizza. There aren't a whole lot of places that all four of us really, really love to eat, but Hideaway Pizza is one of them. And so we had j met each other up there, my wife and my two boys and myself. We were sitting not far there at the Hideaway Pizza in Owasso, just a couple of tables back, or really a table back from the entryway area. And uh, I went to the restroom as we were waiting for our pizza. Uh, my wife ended up going to wash her hands. We, we came back to the table, and there's some folks seated at the table just in front of ours. It was closest to the entryway. And they're talking, and I wasn't really paying much attention. We're waiting on our pizza, and you're just kind of looking around. We're chatting with one or kind of looking around. And, and my eyes happen to notice because the, the server's table, you know, the, the entry table, greeter's table, is just off to my left there a few feet, and I notice some bright red high heels step up. What caught my attention in these bright red high heels, because they're, they're, they're four to six inch heels, they're, they're big boys, was the size of these heels. This was very clearly, I knew immediately, those weren't female feet in those high heels. And so my eyes immediately, because I, I made some quick assumptions and I turned out I was exactly right, my eyes immediately began to scan the rest of what's standing in front of me about six feet away. And it is a man, and I'm going to guess 6'3", six, 6'4", six, big guy, broad-shouldered, has on a knee-length denim skirt, a blouse, 
very long, curly red hair, face full of makeup, um, dressed and form-figured in a way to approximate a female. I, of course, I have no idea. Thankfully, it was all under clothing. And apparently, this individual had just been in the ladies' restroom. And he'd been in the ladies' restroom with one of the ladies seated at the table in front of us. So she's telling this story to her husband and another lady seated across from her, and she's telling the story very loudly. She's expressing her displeasure that that individual had just been in the bathroom. And hey, I'm with her. I'm with her, brother. Those sorts of individuals, if you're a male, you don't need to be in a female bathroom. I'm with you, 100%. Her comments were intended to get the attention of the fella in the six inch heels. And she did. And the two of them began to discuss the situation with one another. And it didn't go well. They went back and forth and she was adamant, the real she, the woman sitting, she was adamant that that one in the heels was not a female and the one in the heels was adamant that they were a female and even, and I'm not going to get, I don't want to get gross, but they even uh, uh, said they'd be willing to demonstrate in front of the Lord and everyone that they were female and thank the Lord that didn't happen. <laughs> But they stepped over. I mean, they are from me to Nathan here, and they are shouting at one another, and my wife and children are right there, and my mind is racing. I am not afraid, but I am trying to imagine if there's anything I can say that might be helpful in that moment. And I'm going to be honest with you. There wasn't. <laughs> I couldn't come up with anything. And so they talked for a, for a little while. They enjoyed a few moments of intense fellowship. And then the individual in the heels walked out. Well, that didn't really end things because after a few minutes, lady or not lady, the person in the red heels starts coming back toward the front door. And at that point, I decided there were some things that I could do to at very least protect my wife and children. And so I told, we had drove separately. I told them, I said, you guys get in the car and get out of here. Go, just go away. And uh, they hadn't, we hadn't finished our pizza and I hadn't gotten my to-go box and I wasn't scared for myself and I'm not gonna leave all that pizza I paid for on the table. <laughs> so I'm waiting for my to-go box and it turns out that the individual didn't even make their way back into the building, but they were waiting on the police that they had called to the scene so they could fill out a form and, and you know. And as, as I'm you know, processing all this, sitting there waiting on my pizza box, it, it occurred to me that probably, because this individual had not eaten there, this individual had come into the facility just to use the restroom. And so it occurred to me that the individual had come hoping for one of these sorts of scenes. That's what they were hoping for. They got what they wanted, they got exactly what they wanted, and now they're filling out a police report because they have been mistreated. But after I leave and I see them out in the parking lot, and I began to think, what, what would I say to that person? I mean, I'm not saying that what the woman said to that person was necessarily wrong. I mean, she was upset that dude was in the bathroom with her. I get it, I'm, I'm with her on that. Not saying that she was wrong in her sentiment, but what, what, sh what would I say? What, if I had that person's attention, that 6'3 man dressed like a female, if I had a few minutes to spend to talk with that guy, what would I say to him? And then the next thought crossed my mind, what would God want me to say to that individual? Because from what I know, what I believe, and what I understand in Scripture, God sees that individual as a very confused, very, very uh, disturbed person that he died for. That he died for. Amen. That he died for. So what should I say? What would I say? What would God have me to say? What would you have said 
Yes, sir, Brother Jerry. Uh, God said uh, to Sodom and Gomorrah, they were doing the same thing, and God spoke the fire. That's right. That's right. And 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 Jesus. Uh, um, um, Actually, this, this fits into what we're going to be preaching on Sunday morning. Jesus actually stands in the temple when he's at Nazareth, and he reads from the book of Isaiah, and I'm not going to give away too much of it because I'm going to be preaching on it Sunday morning. But he talks about how uh, uh, the Isaiah talks about how uh, the Messiah is coming to bring uh, 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 freedom to the captives. And Jesus reads that, and then he sits down. But he didn't finish the passage. He actually, at the, right underneath that, not just freedom to the captives, but to declare the day of vengeance of God. But Jesus came for forgiveness and grace to pay for our sins the first time. But he's coming back. And when he comes back, he's going to come in judgment. Yes, sir, brother. Also, the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. Right. And these people are confused. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's, he's not the author of confusion. So that confusion is coming from someone else. Right. Right. And uh, people like that, um, sometimes they don't want to listen. But there, there are some that, you know what, Brother Zach? Uh, they're lost and they know they're lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Chris and I, we, we, we know people like that, that they are searching. Mm-hmm. Just like you said, sin is sin. Right. No and, doubt. In God's eyes, sin is sin. And... In our church in Norwalk, we never rejected anyone like that. There was a member that his son was gay. Mm -hmm. And he came to church a few times with his point. Mm. So the thing is that they have the right to hear the gospel as well. That's right. Okay? And uh, a lot of them, they'll, they'll admit it. They'll say, I knew it was wrong. Mm -hmm. But they're just so confused, and it's the work of the devil in them that, mm -hmm. that it's, just, it's just messing them up. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what they need to hear from us and the point of what I'm saying, what they need to hear from us, they need to hear the truth mm -hmm. primarily, first and foremost. They need to hear the truth. Because if I'm just going to affirm them for the sake of being their friend or being kind, then I've condemned them. I've made them twofold a child of hell, right? The Bible talks about. But they need to hear the truth in love. They need to hear the truth in love. And sometimes the most loving thing may not come out in the most kind way, but they need to hear the truth and they hear it in love. Yes, ma'am. Wow. Married and has kids now and everything. And Man. He's been married to his wife for almost 30 years. That's incredible. So he did come out of it. That's and incredible. People do come out of that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You have to teach them about Jesus. Mm -hmm. about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yes, they need to hear the story. Yes, sir. There's a lady called Rosaria Butterfield. Uh, she used to be uh, a leader in that community. And she got saved. Hmm. If I'm mistaken, she married a pastor. Wow. And uh, as far as I know, till today, she's still serving the Lord. That's incredible. But um, she was a hardcore um, activist for that. Mm -hmm. And what she said is that helped her is that there was a pastor who invested time with her, and he would have her come over to his house. Hmm. And he just invested time in her. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And he did it in love. It, it was a process. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rosario Butterfield, uh, she came out of that life. Wow. There are a couple of individuals that, that very rarely, not, not often at all, but on a rare occasion, I, I have some interaction with and, and see them socially on a very rare occasion that I'm aware of that are involved in that lifestyle. And um, I, I try to be as kind, as welcoming uh, as I can be. And, 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 and they, they are aware that I'm aware. And they know what, they know what I believe, <laughs> by the way. You know, they know what I believe. They know the truth. But me uh, avoiding them, dodging them, uh, belittling them, berating them, how is that going to bring them any closer to the truth of God's Word? It's not. It's not. So, yes, sir. Yeah, when we were in New York, there was a gay conference going on. I mean, they were, they were like cockroaches on the road, on the sidewalk. I mean, you couldn't go two foot without running across them. And every once in a while, I would just mention, you know, you need to read the Bible. Got to read some scripture, mm -hmm. you know, and I would do it in a nice way. I wouldn't be agitated about it. Mm -hmm. But it was amazing to see, you know, people such a group like that at one time, 
And thankfully they didn't try to attack you or assault you in any way, right? Right, right. right. Yeah, so thank the Lord for his protection. But yeah, we do need to speak up. Do you have something, Chris? Yeah. And then, like you had mentioned, if we take the approach that you had, instead of taking the approach, hey, you know, sorry that lady came off to you like that, but God still loves you anyway. Mm hmm. This is something different. That's true. That's true. And I think that we do, I agree with you. I agree with you. And I think there's a bit of a, a tension in that we, we do want to affirm that God loves them. 100% and we want to be as loving as kind as we can but we can't ignore what God's word says about their sin and it would it would be unloving for them to never know that either so we've got to we've got to hold that truth and in 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 attention I think and I think that's intentional by God that uh, yes this is sin this is sin but there's forgiveness for sin and that God loves us and God died for all of us so that through faith in Him, He could be not just my father, but your father and their father too. And uh, they, they need to hear that. Absolutely. Our, yes, sir, Steve. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so um, my response to that, because you're right, I, I, can't, I can't deny that, and we'd be wrong to ignore it. If we ignored Sodom and Gomorrah, then we're doing what I just talked about not doing and trying to, to split the Old and New Testaments. So that's more of the point of what Jerry mentioned earlier when he touched on this as well. Yes, it is going to be judged by, it was judged at Sodom and Gomorrah, were judged by God in the Old Testament. All those who are, are unrepentant of their sin, whether it be homosexuality or whatever it is, God is, Jesus is coming back in judgment. He is coming back in judgment. But the first time he came to die for those sins and pay for those sins. And we're living in between the first coming and the second coming. And so we, they need to hear both. They need to hear both. Um, is, is it the, and that's kind of, I guess, another study topic, and we're out of time this evening, but uh, is the sin of homosexuality, and this is rhetorical, okay? Don't anybody answer it out loud, because then we're going to have to get into that debate. We just don't have any more time to do it tonight, okay? But it's not something, no, that doesn't mean it's something we can't deal with. The idea of homosexuality being the, the worst sin of all sins. Is homosexuality the worst sin of all sins? I, I get that, that thinking. I really do. I get that sort of thinking. I'm not certain that I can say that that's the case. Because when you see, okay, we'll get to you. Hang on. When you see, when you see God listing sin, um, one of the things, a lot of times when he talks about homosexuality, he talks about um, pride which really is, is part of the, the root behind homosexuality, and we don't have time to go down that I mean, rabbit hole either. What? It's called pride. Yeah. Parade is pride. Right, 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 the pride parade, yeah. Okay, Bob. Man is sin. Mm -hmm. Right, that's right. I mean, they're, they're all sin. Now, I do think, though, I do think that you could go to Romans 1, to, to Steve's point, you could go to Romans 1, and you could see a spirit, a, a degradation, a, a spiral into sin. And it gets to the point where mankind, Paul just kind of says like at the end of it, they're even to the point of 
homosexual, homosexuality and lesbianism. So I think from Romans 1, you can see that maybe God does have a very, uh, um, um, of course he takes a very hard stance on homosexuality. Of course he does. But um, um, that, that's a good point. That's something worth, uh, worth talking about sometime, right? But we don't have time to tonight. Hey, I do appreciate all the audience participation, though. I think Wednesday nights are good for that, for people just, uh, you know, giving a, a thought. That's certain, you're certainly welcome. Uh, to do that. So thank you for those that participated in, and interjected this evening. Okay, with that said, let's get to our uh, prayer list this evening. Um, I do want to remind